all the crazies who were going to India, and uh, so to put our best foot forward, Darwin was asked you know, to, to speak to any of the people who came. But poor Darwin, uh, all the other Baba lovers were milling around as the reporter was there, so he, uh, you know, he, he had to, uh, what could he do? You know, he, couldn't be, he, couldn't, he couldn't protect, uh, it, the, bag, the cat was out of the bag. All these people were talking about all their things, but it turned out really beautifully, and uh, that article came out of that in the, New, in the New Yorker, that Jay Baba article, yeah. But I associate Darwin with, um, with speaking for us, and, uh, uh, and I can't believe, really either, thinking back to 1958, I can't believe that uh, I'm able now to get up in front of people and say Baba's name. Um, Someday, perhaps, I'll be able to do it as beautifully as Darwin Shaw, but uh, thank you, Darwin. Now, I wanted to begin with uh, something from Baba before we just talk about whatever you like to talk about. Um, Baba, in 1962, uh, the rain came one day unexpectedly in November, it doesn't rain, uh, supposedly. In, in Pune, but it did come, as you've read, and we were all drenched, uh, soaked to the bone, and we had all our finery on too, and we looked all sort of like bedraggled, wet hens sitting there, and uh, I was very peculiar about uh, dressing uh, in '62 because my idea was I was going to look my best for Baba, and the only thing that I had, that I thought was my best at 13 years old, was this little gold coat with a, you know, those little emblems on it that the you know, <laughs> kids used to wear. And uh, the only problem with that little gold coat was that it was wool. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is I didn't mind, you know, I, I just was so happy that I was d dressed right that it didn't bother me that it was a wool coat in India. Uh, but the rain sort of, uh, took its toll uh, on all of our finery, my wool coat included. And Baba, of course, teased us unmercifully about it after it happened, you know. And uh, the next day, you know, it rained, you know, and all that. And uh, better be careful today. Are you prepared? It might rain again. Of course, we all were prepared after that, and it never rained again. But, yeah. uh, but anyway, at that time, he said that he said, uh, to, he quoted Hafiz, and first he said, you know, he said, no matter how it rains or blows, he said, stick to your posts. And he quoted Hafiz, he says, Hafiz says, be firm as a rock in the midst of the storm of love, or it might turn you topsy-turvy. And then Baba added, he said, that was nothing yesterday only a shower. So uh, I wanted to begin with that and also with this quote that he said, which is to do with remaining, remaining at your post and firm, he said, a post to stand erect and firm must have its butt in sunk well into the ground. I like that image, don't you? Uh, <clears throat> likewise, my lover needs to have the base of his faith deeply embedded in my divinity if he would remain steadfast in my love. I feel that that's what this weekend has helped me to renew, is that deep conviction in Baba's divinity that uh, sharing with you reminds me of just how divine he is and how many things that he does every day of our lives that are reminders of that divinity. And hearing the stories of all of you today, you know, I heard so many beautiful things from people about their lives, about the commitments they've made to Baba, about all the, the small but yet great things that Baba does in your lives and our lives. And uh, I can only say that I'm, I'm sure that I'm going to leave this place Wednesday uh, with my butt in much firmer uh, <laughs> uh, in the ground of his divinity. And, uh, uh, <laughs> 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 
Well, tonight is a time to tell stories or to talk about things or to listen to children or to whatever it is that we want to do. Um, so, uh, why don't I let uh, you say to me what you think we might should talk about or share to open up? Yeah. <laughs> Where's my watch? <laughs> no, I. Um, that's very sweet. I, of course, that's the that's the loveliest thing to ask a person uh, is to share time with Baba because reliving that is uh, very precious. But um, um, and I would I will. The reason that the two talks I've given so far really have only mention of time with Baba uh, is because. Um, I've been working pretty hard the last few years uh, to try to focus more deeply on Baba, to, to figure out where my relationship is with Baba. And um, my life with Baba is, I just need to, 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 to share and talk about where I am in my life with Baba, uh, because that for me helps me to to grow and to be aware of where I need to work some more with him. And so you've given me that opportunity. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you realize that, so I should, maybe it's good that I say it, that you've given me a tremendous opportunity to grow myself in Baba by preparing the thoughts that I've shared with you so far this weekend. And also, we, many of us in the room, are of a similar age and development, and many things are, we share. And so I feel somehow Baba wants me to, to speak uh, about those things so that we can all um, know that we're going through similar things. So that's why I guess I've emphasized uh, uh, my life with Baba now. But the stories of being with Baba as a child are also not just memories. They are living experiences of Baba. They are our story. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but when I hear, for example, Darwin talk about his times with Baba, uh, I feel he's, he's, it's also our story. And it isn't a memory or a historical event. It's, it's Baba giving darshan again. Um, and that's why he had some people have these experiences, so that they could relive them and by reliving them, everyone could have them. Baba could again be there, as he is right now. Um, one beautiful story that I've told before, but some may not have heard, that comes to mind when you ask about stories of being with Baba. I, I, this comes to mind because it's one of the most important moments that I had with him. <clears throat> that was in 1958 when uh, Baba was going to leave the center just for a brief time. It's the only time, I think, that he actually left the center during his 1958 visit, to go and see the films taken of his 1956 visit. And that was going to be in my mother's theater, which was near the center. So it was a short distance away. And my station, when I was on the center, would be sort of near the car when he'd come out of the lagoon cabin because I figured if I were near the car I could hold the door and maybe he would see me or touch me or, you know, something. And uh, so I would, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I don't know what he had under that pink coat, but... <laughs> Could have been, could have been, you never know. Uh, <laughs> that's about how old I was. I don't know whether that's what I did, but that's how old I was. And um, we planned all these sound effects. 
so I would stand by the door, and Baba came out of the lagoon cabin to go, and Elizabeth was driving, as usual. And uh, I held the door, and Baba got in the car, the, the Ford that he drove around then in 58. And he, must, he looked at me, and I must have this terribly serious, forlorn expression on my face, as though I were a lost child. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a fairly serious person anyway, so you know, I just must have looked particularly forlorn. And Baba said, said, come on, you can go with me, come on with this. Of course, that's more than my heart's desire. And then Baba moved over in the seat of the car uh, so I could come and sit next to him. And uh, it was only a long time later that I realized that, that must have been painful for Baba. Because, you know, his hip was quite bad in, in 58. He, he was carried, he couldn't walk freely. And this was one of those cars with a hump in the middle, you know those old things? And so the person who sat in the middle, of course, had to go up like this. And so Baba moved into the middle and scrunched himself up there on that thing so I could sit next to him like that. And, of course, if I had been older and known, you see, but Baba was so sweet to children, and uh, uh, so I didn't know until years later how, just what, what that meant. But anyway, I sat next to him, and Kitty was in the back seat, another little boy, Chip, who was uh, all sort of standing there with me. Baba let him ride also in the car, and uh, must, must have been Erich in the back seat. To tell you the truth, the Mondali, I didn't know until after Baba dropped his physical body, really speaking, because all attention was on Baba for me, and I, I, they were just there in the woodwork. Anyway, we drove along, and Kitty uh, got it into her head to ask a question. And you know how Kitty is. It's just, if it comes to her, it comes out, it sort of pops out, you know? And uh, we were going along the highway towards the theater, and Kitty somehow gets it into her head to say, oh, Baba, what about Jane and Charles? Meaning my mother and father. Shouldn't they try to, to, to come back together? They had separated about a year earlier. And Baba turned so that he could see his gesture, uh, but that he was looking at me, and he went like this. And then Kitty didn't let that lie. She said, well, Baba... <laughs> <laughs> What about, what about the children? Don't the children, uh, you know, Jane be alone raising three children, don't they need a father in the house? Doesn't she need help, a father? So Baba turned and he looked uh, so that she could see him again. But then he looked right at me and, he, and he, you know, Baba smiled, he smiled that beautiful smile. When he, when Baba smiled, it just, you know, his whole face lit up, and he smiled at me, and then he said, I am their father. And uh, from that moment on, see, I knew that he would be that. You know, and we think of Baba's father and mother and friend but sometimes it's easy to sort of forget that he is actually that, that he takes those roles in our lives. That, uh, well, for example, um, when I graduated from high school, uh, I sent him the invitation that would have gone to my father. You know, they give you one for your father and your mother and everything. Sent it to Baba. I didn't think about it, really, as being odd or strange that I was inviting the avatar of the age to my high school graduation. <laughs> <laughs> now, perhaps, it sounds a bit odd, but... Uh, 
But it was very natural because that's the way he made me feel. Uh, he was so sweet, you know, he made me feel that even though he was thousands of miles away. And, uh, but he never let me forget, you know, and so he sent back um, a message saying, he said, I'm happy with your graduation from high school. Mm -hmm. But, he said, I'm happier still with your aim to graduate in the love of the highest of the high. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, that was a nice graduation present. In there. Also, you know, I had a, a close friend when I was a child, like many children. I had a friend who was a dog. I don't think we either of us knew she was a dog, but uh, I now realize she was definitely a dog from the from the pictures, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, while she was alive, she was definitely just a very real person, and she came to live with me uh, and take over my most of the bed, I must say. Uh, after Baba left the center, just after Baba left the center. And um, her name was Buff. She's a collie dog. And Baba always, not, not one time, not two times, he always sent love to Buff uh, in every message we ever got. And then when we got Puff the cat also to Puff. Uh, <laughs> and the turtle Jimmy also to him. <laughs> And uh, really, they have as many messages from Baba as we do. <laughs> and when Buff, um, she got ill, she got very ill. And so Elizabeth, whose love for animals is legend, of course, um, and that's a whole other subject, but she told me about her illness and took me to see her uh, for the last time. And she added on the cable to Baba, after receiving the family letter, she added on a cable in response to that. She was allowed to cable back about that, that dog Buff was sick. And um, Baba cabled back and to me. And actually, it's very rare in my life that I got direct cable from Baba because he was in seclusion most of the time I knew him. And only for real important work or emergencies was there communication. But he cabled back and he said, uh, your love for me will help Buff, who is also mine. And he said, be resigned and happy to my will. Meher Baba. And uh, it was just, I tell you that because you can't imagine how sweet Baba. I mean, only when we look at our lives now, and some of you told me today of your things in your lives, we just should meditate every evening on the beautiful, sweet things Baba has done for us that day. Because he's doing it all the time. And this is just an example of that. How touching. You know, when Phyllis was talking earlier today about life after death, I thought of my dear sweet dog, you know, Baba taking all that trouble for, for her. Anyway, um, he said, I am your father. And that he lived out. He lived it. He took the job and he took it seriously. He's, he's been a very good father. And uh, you see, that's important because it's not that somehow he's some great cosmic force and you sort of imagine then that he helps you and so forth. It's the other way. He, he, he does his job in your life in, in every small way. And that leads to these big things, Avatar and so forth. To, for me, you know. Because human beings, for us, it's the little things. It's the small things. 
and Baba was so attentive to every detail. Well, we arrived at the theater, and Wendy told you a couple of years ago about that, I'm sure, her meeting with Baba, because that's when she met Baba. Uh, she um, was standing there in a little white and purple dress, and Mother was also in one, they were twins, you know, same dress, and they were standing there. And I was sitting with Baba so I could see his face as he saw Wendy, and he was so delighted when he saw Wendy, you know, who wouldn't be? And he knew, of course, how special Wendy is. Um, and he said, Baba, he said, look, you know, the dresses he noticed right away, he was so happy, you know, he was anxious to, to meet her. So that was the first thing was, um, when we arrived, was that she met him. And then we went in all together into the theater, and uh, Baba sat in his seat that had been prepared for him, and Wendy and I rushed forward and, uh, to sit as near as we could, and the only places we could find were in front of Baba on either side of his, his feet. And he was, had his sandals off and his feet were just there. Um, and it was so beautiful to sit next to his feet. And that's mostly what I watched for the, the time, because I had never really seen his feet before, noticed or anything, and there I was sitting next to them. Since I was kind of small, I was very close to them. Mother objected to this because she, <laughs> she thought we were blocking Baba's view. So she sort of, you know, how mothers try to, to, to signal, to, to move, you know. <laughs> and uh, there's some inner, inner antenna that kids have. They know their mother is doing this, so they, <laughs> they ignore it completely. You know? <laughs> and so she got a little more frantic, you know, like this. And finally, Baba turned to her and said, it's all right, let him stay. And the film started, and Baba... I was, I was very conscious of not moving so as to disturb Baba. I wanted to stay very, very still so that I wouldn't disturb his view of the, of the film. And I tried very, very hard just to, to not move at all. Uh, and sort of in the middle, I got this terrible urge uh, to cough. You know, you know how that is, you get this tickly feeling and you just know <laughs> there's nothing you can do, you know, you're going to cough. And I was getting more and more anxious about it, you know, and I was thinking, what can I do to stop this feeling, you know, and I, it was coming, coming on strong, you know. And uh, as I was absorbed in that, uh, I suddenly, Baba reached out and pats me on the back like this, and I, and I look back at Baba and he goes, Cough, Baba says, go ahead. <laughs> so uh, I coughed up a storm <laughs> and uh, got it all out. <clears throat> and it wasn't until, of course, it's not until years later that one, one realizes who this is that you're dealing with here, but at the time it seemed so natural. The hardest part for me about expressing Baba's divinity is that everything about him was so natural and so human and so real that um, just divinity is redefined. It means that which is most human. So all of those uh, unbelievable things about him, that he really knew your heart at every moment, seemed natural. It seemed so human and natural when you're around him. So it's kind of hard to say how that, what that means in terms of being divine. But years later, of course, when the picture is painted, it's of a divinely human uh, person. And uh, you know, it's hard to imagine the world will ever see someone like that. Uh, he, Every time he comes, I think uh, people feel that way. Uh, how can the world contain such, such a, a, a wonderful human being, such a complete human being? It's, uh, well, so many things happened during that visit. Uh, 
<laughs> that it is indeed endless, and so many things happen in 62, but um, let me pause here for a moment and see if there are other things people want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, several years ago when I was at the center, I remember uh, when people went off the center, and I happened, that might have been the very first time I met you. Uh, I don't know if anybody prompted you with a question or if you posed the question and had the answer at hand, but you, uh, you talked about one word that you felt best described Baba in your experience of him. I wonder if you still have the same answer as you had uh, those several years ago. Oh my. <laughs> but it'll be, it'll be new to others. I'm not sure I do. You remember it. You're going to give me a hint? Is <laughs> it bigger than a bread box? Huh? No. No, tell me. I'm interested. Okay. Yeah. Grace. That's a pretty good answer. <laughs> I'm glad you remembered it. <laughs> Grace. Absolutely. Baba was the most graceful human being I've ever seen. There's no doubt about it. He was all grace. He was never awkward or self-conscious. He was so... Um, he's so confident in everything that he did in every movement he made. Really, I've never seen anyone like that because uh, I suppose that is an attribute of one who is completely uh, realized. I suppose that must be what it is. Even when, you know, he was old and uh, not well and he suffered so much uh, and you could see the suffering etched on his face in 62. It was there. And uh, the pain when he walked. Uh, he needed help to get up. But even then, he couldn't hide his grace. Baba could never hide his divinity completely. You know, it was hard. People say, when will Baba manifest and show himself? But it was harder for Baba not to show himself than we can imagine. The hard thing, you see, for us is to imagine how difficult it is for that beauty and that grace and that love to remain somewhat veiled until the right time. And Baba told us, but we, at least I, really couldn't grasp. He said, you know, in 62, he said, he said, do you have any idea? He said, how I want to break my silence. And what my suffering is. And hiding that, you know, keeping it back. I must say, though, in 62, it was almost bursting at the seams. You know? He was so full of that divine love that just when he went like this to the people who came by him that last day, that public day, and he could no longer embrace each one, the crowds were so great, and he went, went like this, and, and then he took it in and he went like this. And it was, for me sitting there, it was just almost overwhelming because it was, you, I just couldn't believe the you could almost see the love coming out of Baba you know, to these people. Just like that. He just could barely contain himself. That's my, my feeling. He could barely contain it in himself anymore. Uh, he was so really close to bursting with divinity at the end it, from where I was sitting. You could look at his hands and tell. It was though it was seeping out to me. 
I always thought it was like it's seeping out of his sleeves and his feet. And because if you looked at his hands and his feet, <clears throat> even when he was suffering so, even when he was tired, those hands gave it away. Just one gesture. Uh, and to me, again, you could just sow that grace. Uh, and now when I feel, uh, try to think of what it is and feel Baba's grace, because it's that, it's always there inside the grace. If anyone wants to call on grace, it's always there, that gift. But Baba kind of symbolized it, because if you think of his hands moving, um, so naturally, so fluid, it's really the way all of life is. All of life is grace. And the more we become aware of that and, and become in tune with that, then the more our lives are grace-filled. So I picture Baba's hands, his feet, when I think about the grace. It, it was not just a physical grace. It was really, to me, symbolic of what grace is. And uh, every gesture... Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, that, is, that is one good word to describe Baba as grace. Because his gift of love is grace. No one is worthy of that. See? That's why it's grace. Grace means gift. Undeserved and without obligation. Any other gift is not grace. And it doesn't matter who we're talking about, no one is worthy of that. You can never be worthy of that. And the only tragic thing in human life, I find, is when people wait until they feel worthy is grace. When people try to prepare get ready before they really open themselves to His grace. When they try to sort of get their lives in a certain place, and then they say, now I'm ready for grace. Or, or maybe they never say that because they never think they're worthy. I alluded to this the other day when I was talking about a student who went with me to India and, uh, the first time around, 81 I guess it was. And it's a beautiful thing but a painful story because the nine of the students who went on that trip, I was really just completely at a loss as to why I was doing this, or why Baba was having this trip happen. And all the way over to India, I said, now what have I done here? Bringing these people, is this, what is this? And many of them didn't know too much. I tried to tell them. But then I realized the enormity of it. No. Here I am sitting on the airplane with Elizabeth Patterson's ashes in my lap. Going to the tomb of the Avatar of the Age. And going to see Nara and Erich, these people. And here are these nine college students sitting around. I just, I said, what have I done? What is going on? And I wondered whether it was the right thing. A little late. <laughs> you know, but I did. I thought, now what? And we traveled. It took us 50 hours. I won't tell you that story. But it took us 50 hours to get there. They were fine, you know. Uh, I was dead. I was gone. <clears throat> I tell you, to be 18 or 19, something else. But anyway, they, uh, we arrived at Meherabad. My goal was to go straight to Meherabad because I had those ashes. And the closer I got to Meherabad, the more I forgot about them. You know, I just gradually, I didn't think about them anymore. I thought about my dear... Auntie Boo, you know, and I felt 
This is her last journey to India. She loved to travel. She loved India so much, going to Baba. And here I was able to, in a way, go on this last journey and take these ashes. And I was so focused on that and hoping that Baba would let us arrive at his tomb in time so that I could place her ashes next to Baba's feet right away. So that became kind of a constant thought the closer we got. And, of course, Baba, as usual, all the things come in the way and the delays and the this and the that. And the Indian customs, you know, and what is you carrying here? And, uh, you know, the whole thing. So, but never, never mind. We, <laughs> we got through and uh, 50 hours later we arrived at Meherabad at about five minutes to seven in the evening. And I knew Baba had planned it, you see, perfectly because the tomb was to close in five minutes with Arti. So without thinking, really, I started rushing up the hill with my package there, you see, rushing up the hill. And uh, <laughs> about halfway up, it dawned on me there are these nine people <laughs> who have never been here. And uh, I was planning, you see, to get there earlier and explain the tomb and what happens there and a little more, you see, about the tomb, uh, bowing down and all this, you see. Uh, so they'd be a little more prepared for this experience. And I hadn't. So I looked around and there they all were. You know, like little ducks, you know. They were <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know what to do, you know, ex except to follow along. <laughs> I mean, they had gone this far for 50 hours. They weren't going to stop now, you know. And so there they all were, uh, coming along up the hill behind me. And I said, well, all right, this is, I'm, I'm giving this to Baba. I can't, this is too late for me to do anything. <laughs> It's two minutes to seven. I'm not going to stop now. So I went on and came to, the, to, to Baba's feet. And uh, Mani actually had left instructions that Elizabeth's ashes were to be left there, uh, on the right-hand side there of Baba's feet that night. So it was just not my idea. I knew that that's what I had to do. Uh, so I placed there and paid my respects to Baba. And uh, then I stood on the side, and there they all were at the door. And uh, you know, Nanakir was there. Oh, Welcome home! <laughs> <laughs> Brother, sister, Jay Baba, uh, you've all brought Elizabeth here, you know, you must all go in. He's pushing them in the door, you know. Like <laughs> and they were standing around, you know, the two. Baba's uh, samadhi looking, looking down, you see, at this, this uh, thing, looking at the, this dome. And, and then we just stood there in silence for a while, but just before Arti began, uh, four of them just spontaneously on their own, just as we were standing there, nobody said anything. Four of them just went down one by one on their knees and you know, placed their head at Baba's feet. And I thought, well, you know, how much more that means than if I had told them this is what people do or you, shouldn't, you don't need to or you can do what you... It just came spontaneously and they... And, of course, standing there was such a great privilege to see that. Unbelievable privilege. And they put their hand, head down. The, another beautiful part about that moment was that um, a month later, we had been there a month, and we were getting ready to leave, and I thought about it. I really just let them be on their own, mostly, with Baba. And at the end, 
I had talked to them about their experience and their trip, gotten an impression, and something struck me then. But I sort of put it aside. I said, well, I'm just, maybe that's just my thinking. Months later, I again thought about it. And do you know, it was those four people who really came to give their lives to Baba, of the nine. You see? And now when I think back, I remember that image of those, that spontaneous heart being drawn to his feet. And I realized, only Baba brings anybody to him. No matter what you hope for or think about the experience they're going to have, only Baba does it. He draws that heart down. All nine had very deep experiences. And all nine were touched by being there. But those four consider themselves lovers of Mayor Baba. One of the others, one of the other five, at the end of the trip, I said, Bill, I said, how has this been for you, this trip? And he said, well, you know, he said, I, I really like what Baba says. I like everything Baba says, really. It makes sense to me. And he says, and I love the Mandali very much. They're wonderful. He said, but I have a great block about Meher Baba as the avatar. And I said, why? What's, what do you mean? What is the block? You like what Baba says? You love the Mandali? What, is the, what do you mean, block? What does that mean? And he said, he looked at me and he said, The block is, why am I here? If he is who he is, why am I here? He just didn't feel that, he just couldn't believe that he would have that fortune to actually come in contact with not just a master, not just a wonderful saint or something, a great teacher, but the avatar of the age, the Christ. He couldn't absorb that. He felt so unworthy of that. And it touched me so deeply. But, it doesn't maybe help to say, but it's good to remind ourselves that only, uh, there's no way to become worthy of Baba. There's no way. All we can do is accept the gift of his love, his grace, and that makes us worthy to be in his presence. No, it's what suffering will do for you. <laughs> no, he's saying I used to be he, he's not quoting himself, but he's saying someone else uh, remembers me as being uh, somewhat ministerial. What an awful expression. Uh, true, but awful. Um, and that now I seem more open and uh, sort of... Well, uh, actually, um, uh, yeah, I feel I've changed a lot. Yeah, I do, because I've accepted myself, uh, and I've gone from there. There's no point in talking about growth until you accept where you are, who you are, and not what other people think you are or should be, but just sort of how you honestly see yourself, and <clears throat> accept it. Uh, and then the reason I think that if I have changed, and I feel I have, I do feel that, but uh, I feel that the change is because I feel more integrated. Now, I used to, for much of my life, I had to live in different worlds. And that's, um, that was my destiny. I mean, I'm not looking back and saying, boy, I wish that weren't true. I lived in different worlds. I was... Uh, I had my own inner world, 
which uh, very rarely uh, I let anyone into, and a lot of which I didn't understand myself, but I knew it was just separate and private. And I spent most of my childhood alone, and uh, I like being alone, you see. And then I had the world that I knew I had to relate to out here. And so I developed a way of relating to it out here as best I could. But that required, to, that required a kind of disassociation from myself. Baba has worked with me over time to get me to begin to integrate uh, all these things in myself with who I am out here. I mean, he hasn't by any means begun to even finish. Maybe it's just the beginning. But I do feel much more integrated. Absolutely. And once you, once one begins to feel that and experience that, then you can show more of yourself. It doesn't matter. I mean, I don't care so much what people think anymore. And I don't think I need to be loved as much anymore as I did for a lot of years of my life. So I would say it's really been a process of growth in the last maybe seven or eight years, maybe, maybe even as much as ten years, where this has really become a conscious issue. Yeah, yeah because I, you, you've seen that last seven years. And uh, um, yeah, it's, I can't tell you how free I feel nowadays. I feel so free. Because, you know, uh, I'm so happy um, to be living with Baba. And I don't mind all the things now that I have to see in myself and face. And they're very difficult to face, still. But, uh, but they become a part of my personality, too. Yeah. But Baba is really... Um, It's, it's, it's been very painful, but very liberating. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty much open now to talking about anything, you know, everything with Baba and with him personally, privately, and well sharing. It doesn't, you know, and that's a big change for me. Yeah, he's saying how important it is that this transparency that does come about, that you, uh, that Baba is in everyone, and, and eventually everything you know, does shine through. And uh, I really don't think I could continue talking about Baba at all unless I were able to be myself. So Baba had to bring that about. He had to bring me closer to that, or I would have had to stop talking. Because it wouldn't be honest. Baba doesn't require me to be a great saint in order to sit up and talk about it. Obviously not. <laughs> but he does require honesty. And, and he says, if you, if you want to talk about me, you must try to live my message of love and truth first. Well, see, I take that to mean I must try to be honest with myself and with Baba, and I must try to work on those things that are, that are uh, coming up in my life. If I'm doing that, then I can talk. As long as I keep going, keep working, keep trying to be honest, then I can talk. That's how I feel. Yeah. Mm. 
process into a way of thinking about it? Well, I can try um, just briefly, and at least I can speak only from my own attempt to do that. If if we give something to Baba, um, we have to give it freely. And it's important to try to let go. And I guess I have to give examples, but you know, if um, there are some things that I can't do anything about. I mean, I may fool myself that I can deal with my problems my personality difficulties or whatever, or my relationships, to a certain point. But there are some things that finally are, are impossible for me to work out. And those are, are things that remind me that I should give everything to Baba, not just those hard things. So if you take something like that as the hard case and give it to Baba, then what I find happens If I've really in my heart given it to Baba, then I don't mind that it's there to be worked on. In a way, he gives it back, let's say. But he doesn't give it back in the way it was before. He just puts it before you. And the provisional ego is his way of saying, okay, now, you see, I make me the center. Make me... Um, um, put me first in dealing with this problem. Uh, and there's no bindings there. And, you know, it can be just undone and, and dealt with. And also, most important, you don't necessarily then have to act it all out. It will, he will find a way to untie that knot, that huge knot. I think of some of these things as big knots inside. He'll find a way to untie them, slowly but surely, and they'll stay untied. Uh, because uh, you've given it to him. The hardest part is to, is to keep yourself from taking it back and tying the knots again. Saying, oh gee, it's still there, I'm not getting anywhere, and getting upset. Sometimes Baba finds ways to work it out that are a little difficult for us to deal with. And sometimes even shock our own sensibilities, our own opinions. It's very difficult, I find, in my life with Baba to let go of my opinions about things and my images and preconceptions of what it means to work on something or be spiritual or whatever. And sometimes Baba shocks those. <laughs> And this is just my experience, but I feel that often life with Baba, giving these things to Baba, has an element of risk-taking, of leaping a little, you see, because, um, <clears throat> because what you're risking is breaking into territory that you don't know much about, dealing with things that have been hidden so long and are so deep that when they come up, you have, you're unfamiliar. And sometimes you may even end up getting involved in doing things that, that seem to you to be completely opposite of who you are, or who you thought you were. Other people may say, you're not doing what pleases Baba. You're not doing the right thing. And so you have to listen to that and say, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not really working it out for Baba. You listen, but you also don't take their view and their opinion and shape your life. You, you try to go then back to Baba and true yourself and say, give it to him again. It's hard to trust that Baba will work it out in the right way because we keep wanting to tell Baba, no, that's not the right way, Baba, <laughs> because you see, so-and-so wouldn't like it if I did it that way. Or my Baba friends, they don't understand if I do it that way. I have to do it this way. And so we're talking about a razor's edge here, an alert line that we always walk in, these, in working out these huge knots. Because on one hand, we don't want to become irresponsible and say, well, you know, I can't deal with this, so anything that I do, I just have to do. I can't control myself. 
But on the other hand, we don't want to try to live up to what other people think is the way of working something out. So how to keep that, that it? And the only thing we can do there is to remember Baba and put him first and then jump, do it. See, people should never, I feel, this is again, please, my opinion only, but I feel people should never, I don't feel I should ever in, Baba, in my life with Baba um, be afraid, be paralyzed. If I, if I were paralyzed, I wouldn't be here today saying anything. And what paralyzes us is, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to do something off. You know, somebody's not going to like it. I'm going to be diminished in the eyes of the world. Sometimes it's true you are diminished in the eyes of the world. Yeah, and that's the thing. You see, he's given so many examples. Mistakes, we call mistakes, are not really mistakes. But what I'm saying is that we should not be paralyzed. We should do it because if we do it for Baba and we put him first, he will use that because our motive is pure and, and honest. He will use what we decide to do and work it out for the best. If you have a, if you have a choice about some problem you're working on, or something's before you. Should I do this or should I do that? Really speaking, either way cannot be a mistake. So what I'm saying is we should not be paralyzed here at the fork of the road and say, what would Baba want? I can't know what Baba wants. You know, this looks so risky. This looks this, you know. Uh, I know people do get paralyzed at this point. How can I tell whether it's my ego or Baba speaking or what? Baba's given us the way out. Give it to me. Give it to me. It's mine now. He says, it's mine. Now, do your best. Be practical. Make a decision. Do it. Do it. You see? Make it. Make the effort. Go. You've given it to me, so what is it? Well, Baba, what if I chose this and you wanted me to choose that? How could that be? You see? All right, let's say it is. He'll still take this and make it into something beautiful for him. He, that's, his, that's his grace and beauty, is that he takes even what we think are the grave mistakes in our life. But I'll tell you one thing, looking back, I don't have any regrets because I feel that all of the so-called mistakes led me closer to him by his grace. You see, he transforms even my mistakes into stepping stones closer to him. There is, the pattern of our karma is there. It's there from the beginningless beginning. It's there, breathed out by God. We are living it out. We're playing the part. So whether A or B or C or D choice, you see, it's how you make the choice that is the opportunity. And then you leave it to Baba to use that for his work. So that's why I say, and I hope it's not misleading to say, I really don't think you can make a mistake with Baba if you put Baba first. And that's, of course, what he means when he talks about provisional ego, is that learning to automatically, in a way, like breathing, put him first then you make your choice. And, gee, you know, everything is a blessing. And I tell you too, and I think you can all experience this and agree with me on this, the things that you think at one time in your life are your greatest weaknesses, difficulties, mistakes, problems, turn out to be your greatest strengths, greatest gifts from Baba. And I feel so deeply in my heart so that I'm grateful to Baba or what other people would say is weakness or difficulty, because that's been where I have grown. Yeah, I've done things that I wish I hadn't done. I've done things that I'm sure have displeased the beloved. But none of it is a mistake. See, 
Because the Beloved is such that He's used all those things to bring me closer to Him. Why? Because I've asked Him. I say, Baba, take my life. Bring me closer. So He uses the crap even to bring me closer. But I tell you, in my case, He uses that more than anything else. <laughs> Absolutely true. It's the freedom I feel, the measure of freedom I feel today is because Baba has made my weakness my strength. Yeah, John. Could you describe briefly your job? And and uh, how out of the open is your relationship with Baba in your job? And how uh, and with your uh, with your peers in your field, how much do you keep Baba in and how much does Baba allow himself to be with? And how and how open and free can you be? John's asking about my occupation. <laughs> my vocation, I've already talked about. That, that's Bob. But my occupation, how I got into it, I don't know. But what I am uh, at Randolph-Macon is a director of religious life. Strange, but that's what I am. Director of religious life. That's like a chaplain. <clears throat> I also uh, am a professor of religious studies two jobs. When I took the students to Myrtle Beach for the first time and came back and they offered me this job being director of religious life, I thought, well, this is what Baba wants. Must be. See, I had another job offer in Cleveland. It would have been a tenured job and so forth. Uh, of course, the decision wasn't too difficult being it was Cleveland. <laughs> Somehow didn't feel drawn to go to Cleveland. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> no, funny story about that, I, I asked uh, Andy Boo, I said, you know, do you think, ask Elizabeth, I think, what do you think, should I go this job, it's everything I worked for, this job, good money, tenure track and everything, you know, I thought I, I thought I wanted, and Randolph-Macon was offering me a nice position, but it was campus ministry, and I wasn't even qualified, and they weren't giving me any little money to do it, so, the choice seemed fairly obvious, but I had misgivings, so I asked Elizabeth, and she, she said, well, let me sleep on it. And the next morning, I went into her bedroom before I left, and I said, well, what do you think about this job in Cleveland? She said, yes, well, what kind of industry do they have in Cleveland? I said, uh, don't know. Don't know, I think it's uh, dirty. Uh, <laughs> smoke industries. Yes, yeah, she said, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Now let's see. You've been in Atlanta, you've been in Richmond, you've been in Boston. Do you really want to go to another place? Especially Cleveland. <laughs> so I knew I wasn't going to Cleveland somehow. <laughs> So, I became a campus minister, if you will, and I don't know, I never thought about how open or, or not uh, I should be. I'm not as reflective a person as I should be. I need to work on that. The thinking side of me is very undeveloped. I'm a feeling person, and I know I'm in academics for ever and ever, but it hasn't helped. Uh, no, really, and I need to facetiousness aside, I need to be more thoughtful about things. I just go on feeling so much that um, that I forget that you have to think about these things. And uh, Bob has helped me though, grace again, because he makes it all right. I stumble through. I, so I said yes to this job, not knowing what it was. And what it is, um, is whatever I wanted it to be, because they had no, nothing really there. And I work with some nine groups of, of students, and I've developed them in terms of interests I think are important for people today. Amnesty International group we have. Uh, we work on behalf of prisoners of conscience throughout the world. We have a hunger group. We work on the hunger problem. As you know, one quarter of the world goes to bed hungry every night. 
And uh, we have an interracial group, which is still very important to have in, in Virginia. We have a very small number of black students on campus, and uh, they need support. We have a worship group, which plans worship services every week. We have a volunteer group, which places students in various volunteer agencies throughout Hanover County, and, uh, and so on. There are nine of them all together. But that is what I spend most of my time doing, and then part of, a quarter of my time, perhaps, I teach. And in the teaching, I have been rather explicit in the sense that the freedom one has in offering a course, you can assign books that you want to assign. And really speaking, seriously, I feel Mayor Baba's discourses are the best way anyone can learn about Eastern thought as it's come into the modern world. Just from a scholarly point of view, I would say I can defend the choice of assigning to an introductory world religions class when we're doing Indian thought for them to read Baba's discourses. So I have some several hundred students in the last, say, four years uh, have read his discourses through these classes, and some of those want to know more. So I can't really honestly say I haven't mentioned Baba because that is one way that Baba does come up explicitly. In my office, however, and in my work with all the groups, I do not bring Meher Baba up. But of course, when you work with people closely over a period of time, your heart is revealed and Baba comes up. And I keep one little uh, one little picture of Baba on my desk um, that Mani gave me. There was a picture uh, that Adi uh, kept on his desk. And uh, I feel that's enough. You know, it's not visible except to me. Uh, I am there to develop the Christian uh, opportunities for Christian fellowship and so forth as well. It's part of my job. And I feel if I'm true to that job that I'm paid to do, that occupation I have, Baba will give me the other opportunities, and he has, because I'm able to offer a course then of taking people to India or whatever, uh, because I'm trying to do my job. I tell you, I really feel if I were trying to spread Baba's message in other ways, have meetings on campus or posters and stuff, um, you know, I've had that opportunity in Emory and other places. It's a whole other experience. More people have come to love Baba through this, um, this arrangement he's made than any I've ever experienced. I mean, these people come to give their lives to Baba, uh, but my feeling is they were waiting there for him. Really just waiting. Small college in Virginia. Most of them come from Virginia, conservative backgrounds, they're waiting. So they find their way to hear his name and then they take it from there. My peers, my colleagues on the faculty, some of them know that I have this interest in Mayor Bob. I certainly don't hide it. Uh, the woman who hired me, who's the chair of our department, I felt from the very beginning that she had a deep spiritual awareness. And the first day I went to Randolph-Macon for an interview, I told her. I was taking her place for nine months, and I just felt like I wanted her to know. And it somehow came out. And she said, oh yes, I've heard of Mayor Baba, because you see, one of our faculty members has a her husband has a poster of Mayor Baba in his office. He teaches in another college. And he didn't know much about him, but he had this poster so that she remembered seeing the Don't Worry, Be Happy poster. So you see, that was another clue from Baba. And she hired me anyway. I think I'm there, at least to a certain degree, I'm there because of Mayor Baba, not in spite of him. And I don't mean that just in his way, I mean openly. They know enough about Mayor Baba so that they keep me there knowing that. And that is a tremendous gift. I, of course, have wonderful, uh, uh, you know, one has to develop then theological ways to express the relationship between Jesus and Baba and all these things. 
And that's good practice. You have, one has to speak the language of other people. We can't just go around talking our own language. It would be very narrow. I know people who do that in other groups of people. And as Darwin reminded the teenagers today, we are not a separate group. We are the only group that is really not a group. With the avatar, you're not a separate little sect or group or something, because he's for everyone. So it's good to, to learn as many languages as possible. And uh, I have to learn the language of the people that I'm with. And still be true to Baba, and that's the, the trick, I guess. Yes, Virginia? No, I've never used God Speaks in my courses. <clears throat> but uh, that isn't to say some course maybe that would be appropriate. Uh, upper level, of course, probably. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 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 the time is coming for God Speaks to be used more, I think. Yeah, you had a question. Yes. Well, that's a, a big subject, but the heart of it for me, if I were to go right to the heart of what I feel about it, is that the suffering in the world is our opportunity to grow closer to the Beloved. Now, whether our work to end that suffering brings about the result of ending it or not is in His hands alone. The timing of a nuclear war of people imprisoned, of people dying in some starvation. These things are in the cosmic plan of God. But, having said that, that is not the end, it's the beginning for you and I, I think. Because you and I, we are then given the opportunity to grow closer to Baba, to forget ourselves more and more in remembrance of Him by serving. Forgetfulness of self, and remembrance of the Beloved is really possible for, through very few avenues, creative avenues, and one of the most creative, direct, and encouraged by Baba over and over and over again is service to those who suffer. He suffers in each one, you see. And of course, our service is double service because we are not serving them just to give them something to eat or clothe their bodies or release them from prison. We are serving them because Baba is in them. So we are, we are trying to share with them through our service what is real in them. That is real service. But that does not mean that all we have to do is simply try to give people Baba and not feed and clothe and help the imprisoned because Baba has made it very, very clear, at least to me, that to love Him is to serve others. Now, it doesn't mean everyone does it the same way. Maybe for me it's the hunger issue. And maybe for someone else it's another place of, of suffering. Maybe some people have families and they can only help certain people near them. But the alertness that we were talking about earlier and all of these problems Baba brings to the surface, the same alertness can be developed as a, as a real skill and tool in the spiritual life if we are alert to the suffering of others. It's, you see, Baba seems to want to develop detachment and alertness and remembrance. And they're all three connected. They're all three expressions of our love for Him. And any time we have opportunity to serve, and if we can do it practically and with a good heart, then we should do it, not worry about the result. That's the, in service of, to humanity, the greatest challenge is to give the results to God completely, knowing that in His time, He will work His will. Right now in Africa, 
There is mass starvation. The suffering is such that it is indescribable. And that every day, you see, it is such a painful thing to think about. But I do think about them every day. And also in Guatemala, where the Indian population is being butchered, or the Baha'is are being killed and hung and imprisoned in Iran. And even in our own neighborhoods, there are things that are happening. And anyone who says, I love God, is also saying, I love God in each one. And I'm going to serve those who suffer. And that's, to me, the same utterance to say, I love God, is to say, I'm ready to serve within what I'm given to do. And no Baba lover should make anyone else feel that this is what you ought to do. If we do what we feel we need to do to serve others, people get enough from that. They know the message is clear. And they can then take that opportunity or take another opportunity that they see. Yes, ma'am. You know, it's... So many people... Well, I can only say this, you know, it's so hard to say because it's such a huge, huge topic, but... I just don't think if I were to tell you stories of Elizabeth from now until next week, I don't, I just don't think I could convey to you what she did. I mean, very few people knew what she did, and, and it's just such a vast, vast service she did. But I tell you, she got up every morning, and first thing remembered Baba, gave the day to Baba, so that the whole day would be Baba speaking to her. And she lived each day as though it were the only day. And any time she saw someone in need, she found a way to respond. But usually they didn't know it. And uh, when, she, when, she, when Baba took her, so many things came to light that we didn't know about uh, I didn't even know about the family that she helped to have a place to live or the person she put through school or the, the each individual, you see, because she didn't think about it. It was spontaneous. And she didn't need any thanks. She didn't need any credit. She just did it. And, uh, but I must say that in spite of how quiet she was about it, she was known in Myrtle Beach as a person of selflessness and of love of God. And we will be living off of that legacy that is the center for years and years to come. Because that deep respect that they had for her, they have for the center because of her and for Baba. The one thing that she kept in mind always in whatever she did, in my experience of her, The one thing she always kept in mind was putting Baba first. And she tried. She wasn't a perfect, you know, she wasn't, she made all these things. And, I mean, she was a human being, but she put Baba first. And so Baba guided her and, uh, Her spirit, Elizabeth's spirit, was unique. Uh, I'll only offer one image, and then I'll close, because it's uh, so many wonderful things leap to mind, but we can't go into them. But uh,
she, one day I came to the house and I heard her, I heard her voice and it was empty, the house was empty. And I heard her voice and I wondered who she was talking to. And uh, she was on the porch. Um, and so I went in the house quietly so she wouldn't hear me, just to listen. And she was sitting on the porch with a dog in her lap who had been uh, hit by a car and uh, was dying. Had been to the vet, but the vet said would die and was in no pain. So it was just going to, it was terminal, but the dog was just slowly dying. So she brought the dog home and she had it on her lap and she was telling the dog about Baba and uh, just in the way that I'm talking to you now about how Baba loves you, yes, and you be, Baba will take care of you. And the dog was uh, there on her lap looking at her, listening, you know. And that was Elizabeth, and that was who she, she, she was so private, but there were so many moments when you sort of knew, you, you by accident almost came in on her and knew the kind of spirit she was. Uh, someone told me that they came to the center, they hadn't been there in a long time, and they, read, they got their stuff in the cabin and so forth, and uh, it was raining. And everybody had made a special effort. They hadn't been there in a long time, so there was some, Fred Ella had some flowers there, and it was really nice. And Elizabeth came and knocked on the door. And this fellow went to the door. He and his wife were in the cabin. He went to the door and looked out, and she was standing on the little porch there of this cabin uh, and peeking in. And this was in her later years. You see, so she's walking very slowly, and she's bent as you know, and, uh, but she still went into the center to check on things to, the, to almost the very end, you know. And she was in, and he said, Elizabeth! You know, he was sort of startled. He hadn't seen her in so many years, and he heard she hadn't been well. So he said, Elizabeth, what are you doing here? And she said, Oh, I just came to see how you were, to see if you had everything. Is everything all right? And of course, she was peering over his shoulder, looking in the cabin, because she could see what everyone else missed, you know, is there's not, the pillow is not right, or this is not right, or there's a hole in the blanket, you know. So she was peering over and seeing while she was talking to him, is everything all right? Are you comfortable? She often went in before they arrived, but when she got much older and ill, then she couldn't do that as much, so she was still checking though. And they said, the fellow said, yeah, Everything is uh, wonderful. I mean, it's just, we have everything we need. And then he had the presence of mind to say, uh, come in out of the rain, uh, have some tea, or you know, fix you some tea or something. And she said, oh no, I, I won't come in. It's against the rules, you know. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll just, she said, I'll just, uh, I just came by to see if everything was all right. He said, oh, it's wonderful. it's wonderful. Yes, well, I'll be going now. And she turned to go to her car, which was over a distance away. And then again, he had the presence of mind. He said, oh, wait, Elizabeth, uh, let me get an umbrella and, and I'll take you to your car. And she turned and she looked and she smiled. And she, said, she said, oh, no, that won't be necessary. And then she twinkled. She had this wonderful twinkle when she was amused. She said, you see, she said, I'll just dance through the raindrops. <laughs> And so she slowly made her way, you see, off the porch. And she lumbered over like the turtle she loved so much, you know, she lumbered over to the car. But she did. Her whole life for Baba, she danced to those raindrops. And uh, because that's her spirit, you see. And uh, it'll be a long time before we see the likes of her again. Uh, 
You're right, Adele. You know, you said earlier we should have an Elizabeth story hour. Absolutely. Sometime I'll, I'll draw out my bag of Elizabeth story. What a wonderful. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll end on a cheerful kiddieism. <laughs> because no Sahabas should be complete without a kiddieism. Don't you think? I mean, they're the great ones of the past, right? You know the one about the book and all the problem? You know that one? Yeah, everybody knows that one. That's a that's famous thing. Oh, come. Yeah, when, you know, she's in her office, the book room in the center, and the phones are ringing and people are coming in and out of the doors, you see, like this. And that little office is where she'd sell the books and consult with people about all their problems, you see. So the little room was the nerve center. Right? So the phone was ringing and Kitty would still be talking and, and answering the phone at the same time. Sometimes she'd hold the phone in the air, you know, <laughs> She still does this, you know, and keep talking. Oh, yes. You give up drugs. You must give up drugs. Yes. Ooh, yes. yes. What? Oh, hello. Hello. Who's this? Oh, yes. Just talking to so-and-so. Yes. About their drug problem. Yes. Ooh, what is it? Yeah. You know, so she's just like this, you know, and the phone was ringing, and then someone coming in one door, someone coming in the other door, and lunch is ready, the bell's ring. So on that kind of day, so you have to picture that. On that kind of day, she's behind her desk like this, you know, with the phone in her hand, and someone appears at the door, sort of a shadowy figure appears at the door and she looks up and says, ooh, ooh, are you a book or a problem? <laughs> now Elizabeth rarely, you know, she was off in the back doing the quiet stuff, so it rarely got to her. But one day, out of the whole time, it got to her, and that was, I never heard her since before. It really got to her all this activity. People coming in her bedroom unannounced, and the phone ringing, and the people, and all this the dog barking, and the turtle having beef. You know, all this was going on. And so she was sitting on her bed, which was kind of her office, you know, with her writing things. And this day was just so hectic. And the phone rang finally, and she picked it up. She said, Hello, who am I? <laughs> true it happened. But, of course, they're the ancient kiddieisms. You know, the, the time she went on the beach, the ancient one, you know this one? Not the ancient one, but the ancient kiddieism. The, she came back from the beach, we're all eating lunch one day, and she comes bustling in, you know? She comes bustling in. She's so vibrant, she has the dog on the leash, you know? Remember Beauty? That, that awful looking old black dog. <laughs> Yeah. You know, absolutely devoted to Kitty, you know. I mean, he just, if Kitty moved, he was there, you know. And uh, I tease Kitty. I say, next time you come, Kitty, you know, beauty is going to be your child. He's going to be right by your side the whole time. You know? Your disciple right there. So anyway, she's coming bustling in with beauty. And we're all sort of somber. With Kitty not there, it was kind of quiet, you know, somberly eating, you know, like this, you know. And, Kitty comes bustling in late for lunch, said, oh, oh, beautiful day on the beach, people and dogs lying in pairs all over the beach. <laughs> but the latest one, the latest one, which I love, this is one of my favorite ones, Margaret Krask and I used to say uh, that we would make our fortune one day. We would collect all of these, and we would publish them, and we'd make our fortune. Because uh, only Kitty is Kitty. And uh, so the latest one was that uh, my mother had some eye problems, so she went to see the eye doctor. And uh, then she called Kitty later, and Kitty hung up the phone from talking with her, and I think it was Lois said, Oh, Kitty, uh, what's the report? Uh, how, how, is, how are Jane's eyes? Uh, are they all right? What the doctor say? Oh, oh yes, oh yes. You see, Jane went, she went, she went to the optimist, and he had good news, good news. Her eyes are going to be all right, all right. And Lois said, Kitty, you mean she went to see the optometrist? Oh yes, went to see the optimist, and everything's going to be all right. <laughs> and that's the way we should live with Baba, you see. We should, we should have that spirit of Kitty. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. J. Baba. Yeah.